On this show, we talk about how we can help out our local bodies of water. And I'm happy to announce that we are only 95 Patreon supporters away from starting our very own 501c3 nonprofit, Casting for Conservation. Our mission with Casting for Conservation will be helping supplementally fish stock local bodies of water that could use the help. Whether it's stocking smallmouth bass in a river that's had a major fish kill or potentially adding F1 largemouth to the Potomac River to help improve catch rates. Furthermore, Casting for Conservation will also be seeking to help out with boat ramp facility restoration. There are so many boat ramps and facilities in this area that really could use some love. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a jackhammer chatterbait, Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, They'll receive a percentage off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Rods. Members will receive membership-only content, access to our private Facebook community. They'll be entered to monthly fishing photo contest giveaways. And starting in October, we're going to be doing online fishing tournaments as well. Please, if you feel like supporting, we're only 95 Patreon supporters away from starting Casting for Conservation. Link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits Online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today I have on Wade, who just cracked a second place finish at the NVKBA event, uh, the Battle of Five Lakes, Electric Boogaloo. Wade, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I've been really excited. Uh, looking forward to it. So thank you. Yeah, d- dude, I mean, great job amongst so many absolute studs. Uh, that was... I, personally, I was the most scared going into that event. I haven't had a lot of experience on any of those waterways, and and we're gonna get to it here in a minute. But but first, like, h- how did you get into kayak fishing? <laughs> yeah, so I, I I've watched a lot of your episodes. You always ask this question, and I was trying to think of a way to make it a short story. Um, <laughs> but fishing wise, I've been doing it since literally since before I can remember. Uh, there's photos of me when I'm like three years old holding up sea bass. Uh, I grew oh. up in South Jersey. Um, and uh was really fortunate i had my grandparents uh my gra- my one grandfather was a real avid fisherman and uh they had a house on mist in mystic island new jersey that went out to the great bay and so i kind of grew up doing some saltwater fishing and uh the same grandparents had a house in mist uh in hamilton new jersey which was like five minutes away from hamilton lake uh so i kind of had the best of both worlds got to fish all different types and uh, when I got a little older in like my teenage years, I really started getting into like competitive bass fishing. Hmm. Um, you, get, you might know the name, Mike Iconelli, uh, obviously Bassmaster. Uh, he's from South Jersey. And uh, when I started first really getting in, interested in professional fishing, it was kind of when he was first coming on the scene. Uh, you know, he won the Bassmaster Classic in 2003, I think, and that was my junior year of high school, and I was really getting into bass fishing at that time. Um, we ended up joining, me and my grandfather, I can conned him into joining a small bass club up in South Jersey. Hmm. Shout out to my boys up in uh, South Jersey Hog Hunters. Uh, we fished that for quite a few years, did pretty well. Um, I actually, he passed away in 2008, unfortunately, but um, I ended up partnering up with his best friend uh and we fished the same club together and actually won two championships in four years up there which is really cool yeah really really cool um he kind of became like a second grandfather to me so that was awesome and then uh in 2014 i moved down here and no longer had access to a boat or anything and i just went out and bought a kayak i Hmm. you know was missing it you know fishing from the bank wasn't really cutting it for me so i picked up a kayak and i was living in ashburn at the time and was hitting up a lot of the little lakes around there. there's a lot of little little gems in the ashburn area um that and reston so i was just putting into those places fishing little bodies of water having a good time um i actually started a small bass club back in 2021 was just me and some some friends um 
And we ran that for two years. It kind of fizzled out in 2022. And uh, so after that, I was looking to kind of take the next step. I'm, I'm very used to fishing small bodies of water. It's kind of what I've done my whole entire life. Uh, anybody from the South Jersey area would know that it's there's tons of lakes, but the biggest lake in all of South Jersey is Union Lake, and it's only 700 acres. So, oh. yeah. yeah. What is that like? Because we know Ike Nelly's story, but really, what is it like growing up bass fishing in Jersey. It's, it's, it's different. Um, there, like I said, there's tons of lakes, but you know, you get towards the 200 acres and you're talking about like maybe the, the, the larger side of average of a lake in South Jersey. And, uh, wow. you know, New Jersey is one of the most populated States in the country. I think at one point it was the most densely populated state in the country. And so with all that population, you get tons of fishermen. So they're small bodies of water and they get pounded. They're very heavily pressured. Um, and most of the lakes are extremely shallow too. Like you, you hmm. catch, you go out and catch them in six foot and you caught them in deep water. <laughs> really? So, yeah. 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 They're like just shallow, weedy bodies of water. That's why the pickerel really thrive up there. Uh, okay. it's kind of, yeah. Yeah. Chain pickerels big up there. Um, so yeah, it's 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 way different than anything I've really done. Are they electric motor only? Like, how does that? Because I've seen Ike do a couple of those terms. I don't know if he just gets special permission or if that's the norm to use big bass boats. Most most of the lakes are electric only. That doesn't stop people from putting in big bass boats. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, the club I fish with, there were still guys in like twenty three foot nitros and stuff. They're just <laughs> electric only, you know. Um, and there is some bodies of water that you can run your your big motor on you get out on the delaware river and you can run your big motor uh there's a couple couple river systems uh but like union lake is a nine nine cap there's a couple of them that have nine nine caps um so but yeah most of it's electric only how does that shape you then as an angler when you don't grow up with a kentucky lake or a lake erie in your backyard and you're fishing basically ponds that get beat to hell uh, it's definitely affected me, and it's actually kind of why I joined. One of the reasons I ended up joining the NVKBA was to kind of branch out. Um, you know, you definitely have to be a finesse fisherman to have success up there. Uh, the fish, you know, you can catch them on the right day with a power technique like a spinner bait, but most of the days they're just going to ignore that stuff because they see so many of them. So, uh, definitely shaped me of more of a finesse type fisherman. Um, hmm. not like finesse, like you think deep water clear, but you know, still going slowing down, fishing the slower baits to catch fish and a lot, a lot of smaller baits too. What is your thoughts on like, what is finesse to you or for a person from Jersey where it's super high pressured, but it's not deep and clear. Uh, so finesse to me is, you know, like your classic wacky worm type thing. And then like Ned rigs and that kind of thing. Hmm. Um, you know, there is occasion, like I said, six foot deep water, but there are a couple lakes that, you know, get more towards the 10 foot area and, you know, then drop shot kind of comes into play there. Um, but like even stuff I have success with down here, you just wouldn't have success with up in New Jersey. Like I really have started to enjoy flipping and pitching and that's just, again, on under the right circumstance, you can catch them up there, but most of the time you can't doing that type of thing. Really? So, yeah. Yep. What are the bags like up there? Like what would a normal <laughs> winning bag be? Uh, it depends on the lake, but the smaller lakes you get, you get 10 pounds. You got a chance of first place. Dude. Yeah. A lot of small fish, a lot of small fish. <laughs> it's hard for people to understand that they grow up on a very quality body of water, that Ohio river effect mindset where yeah, yeah. <laughs> you are in a line. I remember I had the guys on from um, Ohio and Michigan. They talked about Lake, Ohio, uh, Lake Indian in Ohio where you can have 200 boats on a 5,000 acre lake and it's literally a, a bumper to bumper traffic jam flipping pads. And if you had that on the Potomac, people would go ape shit. Like, oh, I can't believe there's so many people here. <laughs> Mentally, is that's got to have toughened you up to when you kayak fish down here. Pressure or just boat traffic, does that bother you, you think, as much? Um, the boat traffic in general does a little bit just because I'm still getting used to like dealing with that with a kayak. I only have a 10 foot kayak, so depending... You know, if we're out on one of those bigger bodies of water, it's more the wakes that, that can become an issue. Um, but yeah, as far as fishing with other people and that kind of thing, no, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, I'll follow somebody down down a bank and, you know, I have confidence in myself that I can catch fish that they missed. So That's huge. I really think that's a superpower to, to be able to lock in like that because those are the people that win those really tight bumper-to-bumper -bumper tournaments. Um, 
But you know, going with the timeline here, you you, you joined MVKBA. Um, I believe you said last year was your first year. Yep. Was was yep. this your first introduction to tournament kayak fishing? Yeah, yeah. Besides the little club that I mentioned, uh, yeah, it was my first introduction to like big level, what I would consider big level to, uh, kayak fishing. How how would you grade your first season? A uh, decent. Um, like I said, I, I'm still working on the big water thing and I'm, I'm very low tech right now. I don't even have like a fish finder or anything on my kayak. It's a pedal kayak. Uh, actually when I started last year, I was still using a paddle kayak. Uh, first, first three tournaments Dude. of the year, I used the paddle kayak. Um, so quickly realized, Hey, I need to get something a little bit better to, to make this work for me. Um, so I'm still, you know, gearing up. Uh, I would like to get some of that stuff going maybe next year. Um, but yeah, it, it went decent. I didn't, you know, I was in like the thirties and forties for most, most of the tournaments, but, uh, I had my first top 10 at Sleater Lake last year. I ended up, I think ninth. Um, and kind of like we discussed backstage, that's the only lake that I had any experience with going into it. So I felt like I could catch five at Sleater and went to Sleater and was able to do that and really kind of boosted my confidence. Like, Hey, you know, I can hang with these guys. And then, um, you know, I ended up actually, finishing like 23rd in the battle of five lakes last year. Hmm. Um, but I caught big, big bass for that tournament. So Dude, that was my first awesome. check. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, I actually went to hunting run last year and caught a 21 incher in the first hour or so and took big bass. So that was the first check I cashed. And, uh, at the end of the year, they take the top 30 to the classic. I ended up in 31st, mm. but, but one guy dropped. So I actually got to fish the classic, which was really cool. So I, Question here is when you're dealing with big fish, did you try to go for the net for that one or do you try to boat flip it sort of speak? Uh, what in, a in, mind? In, in a kayak I go for for the net. Okay. Um, we'll talk about it I'm sure when we hit Able, but I also had a twenty one incher at Able for this tournament. So <laughs> oh, gosh, that's so freaking cool. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm still struggling coming from a boat background of depending on what I'm I'm using, it's like whether I should just try to just get him in the kayak or screw around with trying to like grab the net and do this because i feel like that's when he's going to jump and throw it versus if i just keep hauling on his ass and just get him in the boat and i, I still fight myself with that yeah i think one of the things uh, for me is i i tend to fish a lot lighter line than a lot of people mm. so a lot of like the horsing of a bigger fish just really isn't an option for me uh so it gives me a little bit more time to play the fish and get the net now if it's a smaller keeper that's where i'm usually just like flipping them in you know depending on what i'm using like if i'm getting them on a sanko or something i'm I'm just flipping them in if it's little, you know? Well, I mean, with, with all that said, now we, we can fast forward to this year. We had Lake Anna, Potomac River, all the smallmouth events, you know, really leading up to this event. How did you think your year went so far? Uh, it's been an up and down year for me. Um, I started off really, really slow. Um, again, still getting used to these bigger bodies of water. And I, I kind of didn't set this up, but most of the stuff we're fishing, uh, the first time I was ever on them was last year. And the second time was this year, right? You know, I, I haven't gotten a lot of time to pre-fish. I'm up in Winchester. So a lot of these tournaments are two hour plus drives for me. Um, so if I can get sneak in one pre-fish day, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Uh, so like Anna came around, I did some pre-fishing and actually had a, a decent day. I only fished for a couple hours and had three nice fish in that couple hours. But then with the weather and the tournament get pushed back a week, it really affected the bite that I had figured out and uh, ended up with one small keeper. And I was just happy with that, you know, and then uh, Potomac, I just didn't execute well. I had, I ended up with two. I, I should have had four. I had two come off. Um, so I started off pretty slow. And, but, but just like last year, I knew I had Sleater Lake coming up. Um, oh, I guess I forgot the Shenandoah. We fished that as well. And that was the first one I was able to put, put a bag together and ended up in the twenties somewhere, which my goal usually is like, if I can get five and end up in the top 30, that'll keep me in contention for the classic. And that's my goal. Every tournament, I'm not really going out there like, Oh, I got a good shot at winning this. It's more mm. just be consistent and try to qualify for the classic at the end of the year. And, uh, so I did okay there and was happy with that performance. And then, uh, Sleater Lake came along this year and I was able to get eighth place at Sleater. Um, you're doing and, good at Sleaters, man. You're, you're dude, I, for high average. Yeah. I, I, it's just, you put me on a lake that I actually know and Mm -hmm. especially a smaller body of water being used to that New Jersey, South Jersey style of fishing. That type of lake is much more into like my wheelhouse of what I'm good at. So uh, yeah, did, did really well at Sleater. Knew I could do well. I went out there and practice, had a good, good pattern going into Sleater and that held up for the week. 
Uh, and then I got my butt actually absolutely kicked at the upper Potomac, the water levels being down. And I had a guy, I had a friend that was supposed to like help me like pre-fish it. And he kind of just ended up not coming through for me. And I ended up just kind of picking a spot on a map and going fishing. And as that tends to work, it didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I was able to get two keepers, which put me in the thirties somewhere on there. Uh, so actually I felt a lot of pressure coming into this event. Um, we have the wrap coming up next and uh, I've spent three days out there and I've caught two keepers in the three days that I spent out there. So I'm like, I need to have a good finish for this tournament. So I actually felt a little bit of pressure coming in. Um, you know, I was in very much in the classic cup, but if I had done poorly on this tournament and then poorly on the next one, like I'm expecting to, I might've fallen out. So I was like, Hey, I need to get a good finish. Uh, a lot of guys at the ramp heard me saying it like, man, I was just like, if I get 12, uh, five, 12 inches, I'll call this good top 30 finish. I'll be happy. So was not expecting to do what I did, but you know, lines up sometimes. Did you pick, and, and, and you mentioned it earlier that last year you went with hunting run and you caught a beast and yeah. that would color. I think a lot of individuals mindset going into this year is like, Oh, I, I cashed a nice big bass check last year at hunting run. Why wouldn't you go back there? If Sleater's like same thing. You went back to back cause you're comfortable there. So, did you decide to go back to hunting run this year or did you want to make a pivot to somewhere else? I actually uh, did pivot. Um, and the reason I pivoted from hunting's run was while I did get big bass last year, um, I was only able to put two other fish with it and wasn't able to round out my limit. And I just felt like how I caught them last year, I wouldn't be able to necessarily duplicate. Like I, I the, the area I caught the big fish in, I didn't get any other bites there. It was the only bite I got in that area. Mm. And then one of the other fish that I caught, I had seen him swirl in the shallows and just threw something in front of him and he bit it. It's not really like a super uh, pattern that you can duplicate unless they're all up there. And, uh, you know, I just, I just didn't feel confident that I could go there and get five. So with that said, I actually went to Abel. That's where I went. And uh, yeah, it was, it's pretty interesting. You guys are probably not going to believe me, but going into the tournament, I've, I've actually never fished Abel. That was my first day at Abel. That's Lake. badass. <laughs> um, and I, let me, let me tell the story real quick. Cause I need to give a big shout out. Um, so my, my truck actually broke down the truck that I use broke down two weeks before the event. So I was supposed to pre fish Abel the weekend before. And, uh, we have a good group of guys in the club and I reached out to one of, one of, our, well, I reached out to a group. We have a group chat going on. I reached out and said, Hey, is there anybody that can like help me get get down there tournament day and uh lee wells came through uh big time he drove up from woodstock up to winchester 40 minutes out of his way to pick me up tournament morning and he actually was going to go to mooney um and so he took a 10 minute detour down there to drop me off at abel and then went to mooney so he none of this would have even happened if he didn't help help a fellow angler out so big shout out to lee no huge shout out to lee i mean he's an absolute gem of a human being and, yeah. and really just huge shout out to mike and everyone at the mvkba it's a really great group of guys and you know and this is not because i know i don't know how many hates i get in the comment section for this one but just generally speaking it seems like the kayak crew is way more not nice is not the right just more camaraderie i guess is what i'm looking for compared to the bass boat crew i could be mistaken just anecdotal but when i pull up to the ramps at the end of the tournaments everyone people are just there talking about how everything's doing and a lot of my bass boat experience, people get a lot more secretive, like really like quiet about everything versus this is just like, yeah, let's just talk, hang out. It's over. And I don't know. I just really like it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I've had the same experience, even with the, the bass club that I used to fish up in New Jersey. Uh, the first couple of years, we were kind of treated like, oh, these are the rookies. They're, they're they don't know nothing about bass fishing. And there was kind of it's weird because it's a small group of guys, but it was almost like uh, we weren't welcome at first. And uh, it took us kind of proving that we could fish mm -hmm. before people started warming up to us up there. And uh, that's kind of been my experience with bass boats in general. So yeah, I definitely agree. The kayak community seems to be way cooler. <laughs> yeah, no, a hundred percent. So I mean, get, getting into it then. So you get to like able, you've never been there before. Yeah. What did you have? What was your strategy? What was your game plan? Uh, so I guess I should first talk about why I went to able. Yeah. Um, I did some research and originally, like I said, Lee was going to, Lee was going to Mooney and originally I said, Hey, I'll just go to Mooney with you. Um, you know, I didn't want to inconvenience him at all. Um, but the night before the tournament, 
I had been doing some research and obviously I'd already decided I originally wanted to go to Abel earlier because uh, I was going to brief fish the week before. Um, but I started really doing some research on Mooney. And like I said, I don't have any electronics on my kayak and everything I was seeing on Mooney, including your last episode, I, I listened to that was that it sets up very much like a structure lake and yeah. it's, and it's much more of a, like a deep water lake where you kind of have to be fishing that offshore stuff. And without electronics and never being there before, I'm like, how am I going to find fish? I'm just, you know, that wasn't going to play to my strength. And like I said, yeah. I kind of had some pressure. I had some pressure going in like, Hey, I need to find five, 12 inches. Um, so I had chosen Abel because I'd watched a few of the videos, including the gentleman you had on last week, he has his channel and I had watched some of his and he's been on Abel quite a bit. And just the way that lake sets up kind of intrigued me. Um, I really liked all the, the weeds along the, the line that uh, all along the bank that grows up on there. And, you know, he kind of mentioned that that's not really a structure lake. There's not a lot of structure there. And so for me, like, I don't know. It was just kind of a Smart. gut feeling like, Hey, I can go there. I think this lake will fish more towards the way I like to fish. Hey everyone. Just want to give you a quick update that there's going to be no Monday night live for tonight, September 9th. I'm going to be on vacation. I'm going to be out of town, but don't worry. Monday night live will return September 16th at 7 PM. So again, no Monday night live Monday, September 9th, but we'll be back Monday, September 16th with some really cool special guests. And even though I never been there, I think I can, I, I felt actually felt pretty confident that I could go there and find five, 12, 12 inches. You hit on such an interesting fishing philosophical thing there of when you can pick multiple lakes, do you pick the best lake or do you pick the lake that's best for your style? And that, that hurt me because I, I was up late at night because I wanted to go to Nye first because of the water quality, the water coloration there. And the fact that I don't have forward facing center on my kayak yet. But I keep hearing the voices, but Mooney's the best lake, but Mooney's the best lake. And yeah, I was, that was stupid. I should not have listened to those. Uh, I should not have listened to those voices. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you've seen it. At least I've seen it the last couple of years with myself, just going to Sleater, like Sleater competes against the res in that tournament. And everybody yep. knows the res puts out a lot of good fish mm -hmm. and you know, I'm surprised if the res doesn't win that tournament pretty much every year. Um, could you get a special day on Sleater and win? Yes, you could. Sleater has some good fish in it, but it would have to be a really, really special day, I think, yeah. to, to pull it out in Sleater. But for me, I know I can go to Sleater, I can get, get five, and I can get that top 30 cut that I really, that's my goal. Like, if you're swinging for the fence and you only care about winning, then maybe, yeah, just fish the lake that you know know is better. But for me, I tend to, f I want to fish the stuff that I'm comfortable with. Cause if I go to a lake like that, confidence is huge in bass fishing. 100%. Uh, it's not just baits, but with what you're doing. So if you go to a lake that you have absolutely no confidence in, you don't catch, you don't get a bite for the first couple hours, that's going to start weighing on you and could just ruin your day. Uh, where you could go to a lake that you're a little bit more comfortable with, get a couple bites, get something going and maybe turn it into a special day. 100% agree with that. I, I really do. And I think that's what's hard with um, when you research lakes that you've never been to is you try to find, you know, what's the best pattern or, or, or how people went there in the past versus saying like, well, how can I go there and catch them the way I feel comfortable? And where can I figure out on the body of water what suits my needs? And I think if more people would start thinking about that, it is easier to consistently win and do well, because it's just you're just plugging in your background onto the place that you're at. Um, I mean, w with all that said, did when did you get comfortable on the day there? Because you're it's a brand new lake to you. So did you ever feel like you got comfortable? <laughs> yeah, I got comfortable real quick. So uh, we launched, and I Leah dropped me off, so I was there way early. And actually, Abel got pretty crowded. Uh, originally, there was just four hmm. of us there, but there ended up being probably not everybody was the, with the club, but there ended up. up probably being upwards of like 15 kayaks out there like guys Damn. actually fishing and there was a couple bass boats and about i don't know probably 12 of those people put in like before the tournament started so it was actually kind of crowded there and again just because i didn't really know the body of water i didn't have any spots to run or any place like oh i need to get here or i need to get there and it's kind of the same thing that happened to me at hunting run last year i noticed a lot of guys tend to have spots and maybe fish their history or you know had a good pre-fish or something to go fish that and they tend to skip water that that to me looks good you know and same thing kind of happened here i i just floated out into that middle of that shallow shallow area right there like right at the ramp uh it's real shallow there and while I was waiting for the tournament to start, uh, I kept seeing 
what, what I was pretty sure was a bass busting on some bait. And I'm sitting there watching my phone, watching the minutes count down, and I got a buzz bait ready to go. And uh, <laughs> and as soon as the tournament starts, I make a you know a cast away from the fish to get that first cast out of the way. A little superstitious there. And uh, yeah, like my second or third cast to where I'd seen him bust, he came and hit it, and uh, that ended up being like a, a 13 and a half incher. But it got me on the board like literally within the first couple minutes of the tournament. And then I fished that for another 20 minutes and didn't get another bite, but started making my way towards the bridge and right past the bridge. Uh, that's where the weeds really kind of start. I, I guess they start a little bit before the bridge, but um, right past the bridge, like 10 yards past the bridge, I switched over to a whopper plopper, actually a chopo, but you get it, a plopper style bait. And uh, like my fifth cast with that, uh, the 21 incher ate it. And uh, mm. I got that one in. And yeah, as soon as I got that fish, I was, you know, I was, I was feeling good. Um, I was like, all right, I made the right decision. Um, How much were you shaking when you got him in the boat? I'm always shaking after a big fish. <laughs> it's still <laughs> uh, like, I've been fishing probably for 35 years now. And it's still such a rush, especially when you get a big one. And, mm. um, you know, growing up in South Jersey, kind of like we talked, you don't get a lot of opportunity at like really big fish, you know, um, a four pounder is a very big fish in South Jersey. Uh, so <sighs> down here, you run into them a little bit more often, but still anything in that five pound range really gets my blood going. So, uh, yeah, it was awesome. So I got that felt comfortable. Although I will say sometimes catching that big fish early kind of stinks too. Cause it does put a lot of pressure on you. Cause like I, at this point I'm, I'm literally like a half hour into this tournament. I have a, a small keeper and a big fish and I'm like, man, if I could get something together here, I, I could have a shot anytime. I feel like everybody that wins this, you got to have one of them big fish to win it. You know, almost big fish almost always goes for like 20 plus inches. And the guy that wins either has a lot of like 18s or has like one big fish and then a bag. So I feel you like bring when you something up, that's interesting. Cause you're right. I get the anxiety of like, I don't want to waste a good fish versus yeah. if I just never got the good fish to begin with. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel like you kind of have to capitalize on that and, and it puts pressure on me. So I didn't last year at hunting run. And here I am a whole year later at a different lake, but for the same tournament with another 21 incher around the same time I had at hunting run. And I'm like, man, I got to put something together today. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I got that. And then the rest of the day kind of just, it was a classic junk fishing day for me, really. I, I didn't necessarily put together any pattern. Um, it was actually one of the few days I was kind of joking with the guys after the tournament, one of the few days that bringing all five of the fishing poles I brought was worth it. Cause I caught a keeper on everything, you know, usually you end up focusing and I end on something and you only fish one or two poles. And at the end of the day, you're like, why did I bring the rest of this stuff? But, uh, yeah, I, I, I caught fish doing pretty much everything that I was doing. Uh, and it was, it was fairly consistent. It wasn't like I, I was crushing them, but you know, I was catching about a keeper an hour and catching dinks in between yeah. yeah catching dinks in between so i was still catching stuff too um all all told i probably caught something like 20 bass and nine of them were keepers so Whew. yeah and uh really i didn't even get the fish the whole time uh, i took an hour and a half trying to get my photos uploaded because of that unique Ooh. situation with lee um i knew if i got back to the ramp that I didn't have a vehicle to jump in, to go into town, to try to get my photos uploaded. And I didn't have signal like anywhere on the lake, oh, on shit. the lake. Yeah. So I had to try to find somewhere. So I did, I took about an hour and a half to find, find a signal and get the five. Once I had five, get them uploaded. And, uh, you know, probably wasted a chunk of my tournament day doing that too. <laughs> when in the day did you feel like, like, so I think it's like the, the two pivotal fish really is to me is your third or fourth, depending on who you are. Like, because at that point you can say like you're over the hump. If you if you get three in the boat, you only need two. If you have, if, once you get to that fourth, it's that relaxing of like I just need one more bite and I got this. Yeah. When was that pivotal moment for you that day? <laughs> actually, pretty interesting. So I ended up with eighty and a half inches, but I should have had eighty three actually, because mm -hmm. um, my fourth keeper of the day was about a fifteen incher that flopped off the board on me. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I haven't had one of those happen in a very long time, and. Uh, you know, that for a second, I felt myself spiraling a little bit with that because that can really derail any kind of momentum you got going. But I was able to buckle down and just get back to fishing. And uh, really, um, I'd say the fifth fish for me is usually the hardest because, um, like I said, my goal is usually five. So 
I feel like the first and the fifth are always the hardest to get. And I mm-hmm. always feel better once I get that fifth. And uh, I pulled up to the bank. There's one bank that's really steep that has a lot of big rocks on it, near like in the first third of the, the lake. And I actually caught the fourth and fifth keeper pretty close together on that bank. Um, and after I got that fifth fish, uh, I felt pretty good. Now, at the time, I had a 21-incher a uh, 13 and a half. And then my other three fish were like 12. So I knew I had a lot of work to do, but um, once I got the fifth, I was like, Hey, I got a limit. I've completed my goal that I set for the day. I knew from past experience that, especially with the 21 incher in, in there that I'm like, all right, I definitely made the top 30 at this point. Uh, so I completed all my goals. So let's just have some fun and go fishing and see what I can do. That's so, yeah. Getting your head in the game and staying in the game is so freaking important. Um, yeah geez dude you had it one of those absolute special days when when you caught that big one on the whopper plopper did you ever have like a a nervous gut reaction because this goes back to the netting thing which i think is interesting that he was going to come off was he throwing like crazy when you're trying to fumble for the net so uh actually pretty funny um he didn't like blow up on it real hard he kind of did one of those which i've heard a lot of bigger fish do he kind of just sucked it down it wasn't like a big, big hit. And I didn't really get a good look at him. Um, I knew he was decent. Uh, and he's kind of swam by the, the, or I guess she swam by the kayak. And I honestly, when I got my first glint, uh, glint of her, I thought it was like only like a three and a half, which still would have been good. Um, and then she kind of dogged under the kayak. And when she was doing that, I reached back and grabbed my net and it just was like, she came up and I netted her. And when I went to net her, she didn't, I have a smaller net. She didn't really fit in the net. And it wasn't really until then that I realized how big she was. Uh, so usually, yes, yes. I would be super nervous. Like the one at hunting run last year jumped a lot. This, this, this one didn't jump at all and uh, fortunate there, but I've had some big ones come off in the past on the plopper. So if I had seen her, I probably would have been more nervous. Why the plopper? A plopper and a buzz bait you had tie on. That's a unique combo. Um, I just felt like with, with how Abel sets up with that grass line, a lot of times in the morning, those fish are just, I assume, you know, I'm not, just on past experience that they'd just be cruising that shallow uh, line of grass. And there's a lot of deeper water. I say deeper, but, you know, like 20 foot depth, that's not that far for those fish to get to. Hmm. Um, so like, especially on a summer day, I, I feel like a lot of times in the morning, everybody talks about capitalizing on the morning bite. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just confidence thing with why I had both tied on. I'm, I'm not actually super confident with the, the buzz bait. I hmm. don't have a lot of success with the buzz bait. I've had a lot more success with the whopper plopper, but I wanted to try the buzz bait out in the morning and I did get that first fish. But then when I went 20 minutes without like even a reaction or anything, I was like, ah, eh, maybe, maybe that's not the noise they're keying in on this morning. And I just flipped over to the whopper plopper and funny enough, that ended up being the only bite I, I got on that as well so <laughs> when i say kind of like the stars kind of aligned they really did for me that day uh you know i i didn't it, it was a junk fishing day i just fished a bunch of different stuff and caught fish on a bunch of different stuff no no real pattern i fished the stuff that looked good to me and and caught fish on it growing up where you fish smaller bodies of water where you do have to basically rotate through the same crap because it's a small lake. There's no new stuff. Yeah. Did that factor in at all during the tournament where it was like, I'm going to go back through this area that I caught them in, or was it just always fish new water? No, no, no. I, 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 I very much don't fear fishing areas of water that I've already fished. Um, in fact, like most of the time I rotate back, you know, I like to try to give an area some time, even if I catch a couple of fish out of it, rotate, leave it alone for an hour and come back and, and see. Um, I think, yeah, like my, my past experience in South Jersey definitely played into this tournament completely. Cause that's why I chose to go to Abel in the first place. You know, it's only 185 acres, um, a lot of weeds, not a lot of structure. So I kind of fish, you know, fish the cover, which is more of what I'm used to fishing. And, uh, you know, it just felt like I could cover more water that actually had fish in it than if mm-hmm. I went to some, somewhere like Mooney and was just kind of blindly fishing, and knowing that, hey, they're down there somewhere, but I can't see them because I don't have electronics. So, <laughs> no, that's interesting. Yeah, I and mean, again, it gets back to what we said earlier in the conversation about just picking the water that suits you, not just the best body of water. D- did you have a moment at all during the day where it's like, I think I just did a thing, like I did above and beyond what I could have expected? Um, 
Yes and no. I, I there was there's a point during the tournament. Like I said, I, I didn't have connections, so I couldn't see like look at the leaderboard and know what was going on there. Um, I think when I finally did get to around 80 inches, I know usually these type of tournaments, like if you get to 85, you got a good shot, you know, depending on the body of water, some of them, it takes more, some of them, it takes less. Um, but I knew if I could get somewhere around 85, I'd actually, you know, maybe have a shot at winning it. Um, and so there was a little bit of uh, time there where I was like, hey, man, I just need one or two more big bites. Um, in the end, I'm actually really happy. I didn't get another big bite. Cause if I did that, that one that I have flop off the board would probably be haunting me for the rest of my life, to be honest. Uh, cause with that one, like I said, I would have been at like 83 and then my smallest would have been 13 and a half. So if I had been able to find another, you know, 19, 20 incher, I would have been right there. Uh, so part of me is happy that didn't happen. Uh, cause yeah, like I said, that one would haunt me. Um, but yeah, once I got to 80 inches, I'm like, I'm solidly in the top 10. I'm, you know, I've gone well above what I was hoping to do for this tournament. And, you know, we're just really happy about it. Dude. I mean, you had an absolute bang and finish and, and honestly coming off like the Potomac where you said you weren't super happy with the upper Potomac finish. That's gotta be really nice to be like, to, to recorrect your season going into the last event here. Yeah. Yeah. It took a lot of pressure off of, done the math. I'm already in the classic, so I don't even have to worry about it. Uh, so who knows, maybe I'll, just because there is no pressure, maybe I'll have a good day on the wrap too, but I'm not well, sure about that. <laughs> what are your thoughts about the wrap going into the Rappahannock tournament? Uh, like I said, I, I last year, first time ever on it, uh, I, I think I spent three total days out there, probably somewhere around 20 hours total, because uh, I did get a couple pre-fish days, and I, I just don't know it. You know what I mean? I think a lot of these bigger bodies of water, you know, y you have to, you don't necessarily have to know, but like what happened at Abel? I don't think it happen at a place like that. You really have to know that body of water because there's so much dead water and you can waste so much time fishing areas that there really isn't any fish. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I'd like to say I'm going to do good. I'm going to try to get down there and pre-fish, uh, but I'm not going to be upset if it doesn't go well. Uh, I've already accomplished my goals for the year. So really excited with that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how the rapid panic event goes. Cause it's kind of, it's tidal, so I feel semi comfortable, but I've never been there. So there's also that that mystery there to it. But I know there's good fish in there too. So, yeah. and it shouldn't be dinking and dunking. It should be a lot more power fishing based stuff, even though it's September. It'll be fun. It'll be really fun to see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, somebody will find them. They always do. So, uh, you know, might be me, but probably not. <laughs> what is one thing that you want to get uh, for Christmas this year for your kayak? Um, a new kayak. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, so I, I do have a, a, a bass boat, um, that I'm going to be looking to unload a little, little John boat so I can, that's taking up my trailer space right now. And I would like to upgrade, uh, maybe not necessarily for Christmas, but upgrade to a, uh, a bat, uh, a kayak that I can put a trolling motor and get some electronics going right now. I, I fish out of a native watercraft Slayer propel, and I just don't feel like I have the room to even like, I know I could do small electronics, but I just feel like I'm already kind of cramped in there. And I, I want to go up to a 12 footer and, you know, kind of do it, do it right and get a trolling motor and that kind of stuff going. What brand are you thinking about? Uh, right now I've been looking a lot like uh, for the Bonafide. Uh, I think they're one sit on top. A lot of guys have a lot of success with the trolling motor install in the front. So yeah, I kind of I was always thinking about that because I think I, I ran into um, Eddie at uh, nine. He's got the trolling motor on the front of his, and it's just I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd ever do that. Um, I have one on the back, but I get if you fish a lot of big lakes, the front makes so much sense. But I'm a river rat, like on the Shenandoah and the Upper Potomac, so I feel like I would just snap that bitch off real, real. Quick. Yeah, see, I, I, I like. <laughs> The Shenandoah and the Potomac or the Upper Potomac, I don't think I'd even bother going with a, a trolling motor. So yeah. I, I'd, I'd very much keep my, uh, I have a sit on top too, like um, just like a paddle one, the one I started last year with. And I use that in the kayak, uh, in the uh, shallow river tournaments. And I probably just continue to do that. What I have to ask you, because you're from Winchester, you know Lee, he's a masochist for this lake. What do you think oh, of Lake Frederick? Oh, no, don't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, again, it's kind of like the rap. I, I've I've been out here for five years now. I've probably put in about three days on there and maybe one keeper to show for it. That place is tough. That place is it very sucks. Tough. 
very <laughs> tough. And uh, yeah, it's a easy no brainer for me to go to Sleater over that. And Sleater's about twenty minute drive, so it's actually about the same type of drive for me. Is Sleater's what you consider your home lake, or would it be more like one of the ponds or things in Ashburn that you consider more of like your homish body of water now? Uh, my home lake is Hamilton lake up in new jersey that's my home lake really? <laughs> um, yeah yeah it's the lake i grew up fishing like i kind of mentioned uh i guess i could tell this story make my grandma a little proud um my grandfather and i like i said joined that club and uh i think it was our second year uh we were fishing with the club and uh we actually got our first ever tournament win at hamilton lake which was our home lake so it was really really special my grandma came out for the weigh-in and stuff it was really really cool uh so that is definitely still my home lake even though i haven't fished it in probably 10 years i consider that my home lake that's so cool dude i mean guys i mean really give this guy a round of applause here you know number two finish here at the battle of five lakes which is a complete slug fest on out on lake mooney here sneaking in doing what you do best and getting that second place finish and so close to big fish as well really yeah. really close um wade thank you so much for coming on i really appreciate it link in the episode description to everything that we talked about guys if you'd like to you know hit that like button it really helps out in the algorithm and we'll see you guys next time on fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your host thomas aarons fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia if that doesn't get you jacked up i don't know what will